Massive thank you as always to patrons Sarah Turner, Rebecca Johns and Justin Harper. And this week's random call out goes to patron Anna Donnelly. You can support us too at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head or follow us on social media and help spread the word. This week we're going to do something a little different. Uh, Someone tweeted at us if we had any episodes about graduate school slash PhD programs and the answer was no and as a result I spoke to four different people, two from the US and two from the UK, about their experiences. Each person had something unique to contribute, and I hope you find it as interesting as I did talking to all of them. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. In your head. The landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. First up is Catherine. I went right from undergrad into a PhD program, with which some people strongly discouraged me from doing and other people said, you know, if you know you want to work in academia, you know you want to do research, you have like, this is the best option if someone will take you. Now I can like reflect on it and remember how much people were preparing me for the worst when I was like talking to professors about PhD programs, right? So they were always like, make sure that they're paying you. Never, never go into a program unless you're getting a full ride, a full scholarship. Um, Make sure that you have a champion in the department who wants to work with you. Um, Make sure that, you know, you get along with the other cohort, like talking about things that need to exist in order for me to have like a mildly (laughs) successful experience. Um, Because without any one of those things, you are subject to the sort of internal politics of that department. And I mean, a lot of times, especially in political science, right? And like people will argue that different fields are different and they are, they function different differently. Political science as an academic field has always been incredibly competitive and incredibly toxic in my experience. And so going into a PhD program in that field was, it just felt like going into battle, right? Like I had to walk into this brand new university find someone who was going to champion my work, because if not, like I might not get offered a second year at the university. I might not get offered to start working on a dissertation. If I can't get a few people to be on my dissertation committee, I stand no chance of graduating. What does competition look like? Or what is that atmosphere? What is the feeling? Um, So for me, it was very much, there was always like this unspoken competition among students to be the first to publish in your cohort Um, if you're top of your class, you get access to more grants, more recommendations, because even though they pay your tuition, right? So the way that you're paid as a PhD student, if you're given like a full ride, they cover your tuition. Um, sometimes they give you benefits. It really depends on the university. Um, but you, and they'll also pay you like an additional stipend on top of your tuition, right? So that way you don't have to find other work. But I mean, at Georgetown, rent on average was about 1200 back in 2013 when I was in the program. And I think I was getting $1,400 a month. So that was leaving me with like, yeah, like one to 200 a month to pay for everything outside of rent. Um, so yeah, so you would fight to sort of be the top of your class to get extra grants, to get extra scholarships, to work with a professor to make some extra money on the side. Um, And then you would also need to win grants in order to actually fund your dissertation research. And then honestly, you're competing with other professors and people in the department. Um, Especially for me, I found myself caught up with um, professors who were fighting for tenure track, right? So what that means is when you're tenured, you know, you have this contract that they can't fire you under like almost any circumstances. But um, for people who want to be tenure track, like they have to have a certain number of publications under the under their belt. They need to um, have a certain type of like level of reviews from other students and like success in their courses, right? In order to actually get that position. So there was a professor who I was taking a class with. I was working on sort of like developing a potential like dissertation idea in that course. And I met with that professor every single week Um, got great reviews, got great feedback, incorporated all their feedback. There was no indication that I was not succeeding in that course and doing overall well in the program. And at the end of, at the end of every year, you get a review with your department. So I sat down to be reviewed by my department 
And she was one of the people who sat in on my review and the tone of the review started going negatively because I, there was like one class that I struggled with and I think I got like a B plus in and they were just ripping into me over that and saying, you know, I'm not meeting like their academic rigor and they're, you know, nervous about like my future as a student. And this professor just chimed in and was like, yep, in my class, here's X, Y, and Z and everything you've done wrong. And I point blank said to her in the meeting, I was like, hey, like you never gave me that indication prior to this meeting, right? How would I have known like you gave me signals that everything was going well? And it was clear that she was doing that because that was the department chair. So it became pretty obvious that she was siding with him so that she would get a better review when she is up for tenure, right? It's like a Netflix political drama. It's like- It is, uh, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. So then the last piece of it is like people who, again, like want to get tenure, um, and even professors, there's a lot of professors who like have tenure, but haven't published in a while. And it, and the department will be like, Hey, like it's been a few years. Can you put out some type of article to sort of keep up our, you know, um, reputation and especially in political science, I'm not sure for other fields, but in political science, there is a lot of professors and, um, tenure track professors who steal ideas from graduate students. Oh, and the Jesus. implication of that, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's really wild, right? Um, and the implication of that is like, especially if it's your dissertation idea, your dissertation has to be something that is completely original that no one else has worked on. That's the only way you'll get your PhD. And I've heard nightmare stories of students spending three to four years working on a dissertation with a committee of people, and then a someone who serves on their committee will publish an article on that exact topic using their research without notifying the student, without putting them as a co-author because they haven't published in a while and they really needed to publish something. Jeez. Wow. And then that student has to start from scratch. Do people in more senior positions then see it just as a rite of passage and that this is just something you have to sort of struggle through or is there that sort of yeah. recognition? No, I, I think that's absolutely the case. I think. Um, especially like I tried to reach out to, you know, I identify as a woman and I tried to reach out to other female professors to talk to them about their experience. Cause there also is the added layer of racism, of sexism in the, in academia. And I was like, Hey, listen, like, you know, what, what was your experience like going through your PhD program? And everyone that I talked to sort of gave me that speech of, well, this is what I had to do in order to get where I am today. So you have to do the same, right? Not that I paved the road so that it could be easier for you so that you would face less discrimination. I was constantly told that this was part, this is a rite of passage, right? This is part of the course. And um, especially because one of the major contributing factors on top of like the toxicity, the pressure, the competition, um, one of the major factors I left the program was because I was also sexually harassed by a professor who was supposed Whoa. to be my first year advisor. Yeah. What? And yeah. And I talked to female professors, other professors about it. And the response I got from everyone was, oh, yeah, we know <laughs> he's just like that. He's been an issue for years. And because he's tenure track, they can't fire him. What? And yeah. And I took it to human resources. I escalated it within the university and I even like showed up, you know, as a political science student with like my definition and their definition of what sexual assault is. And I explained to them like this person was offering me an opportunity in exchange for sexual acts Whoa. and their response. Yeah. And their response was very much, oh, well, like, did you record it? What were you wearing? Did you meet with him off campus? Just a very, like, it just all seems to fall into this rite of passage. This is just a cutthroat industry. And I think they very much set students up to fail. Like they don't want students to succeed in my experience. So, I mean, it, <clears throat> it's kind of distressing, or, or I guess maybe not surprising that potentially the most, um, potentially some of the most successful people in that field I use success in a loose term are potentially the most cutthroat or most psychotic. And then they're the people advising um, other people, you know, about mm -hmm. how society should be run or something mm -hmm. like <laughs> that's kind of a terrifying. Um, it is, uh, it is. Yeah. They're, they're advice. They're putting out research on how the world should be shaped. They're advising other people on how society should be shaped. 
Um, and they're also determining who gets into the grad program and who continues that legacy, right? Because they serve on the admission committees and they read people's essays and decide what research is worthy of being part of their department or not. It's also interesting, like the whole the whole idea of tenure is not exactly... Um, it doesn't really align sort of with, uh, you know, the market or c- capitalist values. It's actually quite, mm-hmm. you know, it, if anything, it's something that everyone should, you know, have have an ability to, it's the dream, right? Which is that right. you, you get to do what you want and you get well paid for it and you can feed yourself, you've got a house and you, you know, mm-hmm. you get to do interesting things with your time. Mm-hmm. And why that should only be allowed for a certain sort of class of people is is the right. part of the problem, right? Um, yeah, and I think the origins of tenure, to my understanding, were that they wanted to protect professors from political retaliation, right? And that's like across the board for every industry um, or for every field, right? Saying that, okay, well, if you're tenure track, then we can't fire you as a university because we disagree with the research that you put out, right? For whatever reason. Um, so it, it's supposed to protect the integrity of the work that they're doing and the integrity of the institution. But in reality, I, I, some, in some departments it works out brilliantly, but at least in my experience, um, it really just encourages a lot of people to act poorly, not put out research um, and exploit students to do work on their behalf, right? Rather than putting out really cutting edge research that is pushing our understanding of society, of the world. I'm incredibly happy that I dropped out and that I made that decision, even though at the time it was incredibly difficult. And I had so much pressure from my parents saying, well, what are you going to do now? Like you were going to be a doctor, right? Like what's going to come for you next? What type of job will you have now? Um, Because dropping out of a PhD program for me meant I only had my bachelor's, which a bachelor's in political sciences just means I can bullshit fairly decently. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, I mean, it, it was incredibly difficult, but yeah, I completely agree with you. Like I had that experience in order to learn like what I do and I don't want out of a career. And I was someone who very much was raised. I had a, I have a sibling who's 12 years older than me. So he was giving me Chomsky when I was 12 years old. Um, yeah, which was, I'm so grateful for that, but I was really exposed to like socialist and anarchist and, and communist theory from a young age. Um, and really had always questioned the, the individualism and this like pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality that we have in the United States from a very young age. And I got caught up in it. Like when I was in my PhD program and when I was applying for it, I was like, I've earned this. I've worked harder than other people. Like, you know, I've put out all this other research um, has like, you know, I was successful as an undergrad. I like did a research conference in the Middle East. And really just sort of got caught up in that mentality of like, yes, like meritocracy, I'm doing the work, I should get into this program. And as soon as I was there, I was like, the whole system is rigged. (laughs) The absolute (laughs) whole system is rigged. Now we jump across the pond to the UK. This is Claire. So my parents both have PhDs. Um, They actually met sort of studying at UCL, which is which is where I got my PhD as well, University College London. So so there's always been like that academic background. I did like my PhD in neuroscience. Um, Can't remember if I mentioned before, like my first degree is in psychology and philosophy. So I did that at Oxford. And the goal sort of for me when I was going into the PhD was to essentially spend my life in research. I'm sure probably the people you talk to from the US will talk more about like teaching responsibilities and things. The PhD is very different structure there or anything. There's definitely more of an emphasis on that. I I didn't have that because my my PhD was sort of entirely research based. I sort of went into it thinking like, oh, this is going to be like a chance for like intellectual freedom and sort of doing what I want and and all of that. Um, And in fact, it it was a lot more sort of rigid and structured than I expected. For me, what like really put me off academia is, uh, so I was in like a really great lab uh, at UCL, like one of, you know, one of the sort of world leading labs that publishes and like nature and, and all of that. And <clears throat> like a really great team, lots of grants. Um, and I was seeing that the postdocs in the lab um, who were sort of trying to look for their first, you know, post postdoc role as assistant professor or whatever, even though they were from like one of these like 
top labs in the world in this particular field that had loads of money that was, you know, in like a really hot sort of research area. It was a big struggle for them to sort of find um, a role, like in both in terms of sort of like number of applications they had to make. Um, and also, you know, um, in terms of sort of the lifestyle or like quality of life compromises that they might might have to go through. So obviously one of the ones a lot of people talk about is pay. Another of the ones which was like a massive constraining factor for me is like geographical location. So so sort of if, if one wants to make it in an academic career, my sense was, you know, because it's so competitive, you have to be reasonably ready to kind of do you know like okay I'll just like move myself to sort of wherever wherever that academic job is going to be so like most people like do a postdoc sort of abroad somewhere and then maybe that academic job is like somewhere else and you don't essentially have much control over sort of where you where you choose well yeah you can't choose in a lot of cases sort of where you end up um, and like, it, I guess it's, it's sort of just seen as a inevitable cost of the process. You know, the whole structure of, um, uh, as you're saying, like, of like, okay, you sort of chuck a bunch of people into it and sort of 90% of them fall out and sort of don't have a good time, but maybe there are sort of the, the few percent who succeed and how academia, academia, sorry, is, is like very much structured at that, as that kind of like managerial pyramid, right? You have like loads of PhD students, you have like still quite a lot of postdocs, and then like it, it, the, there's like not so many permanent roles, and then right at the top you have some like professors who a lot <laughs> or like the, the administrators that like the deans and the heads of department and and so on um and and i guess there are sort of like two problems i see with that which is like well why why does it have to sort of be a funnel where it sort of cuts people out as as it goes on why can't we have sort of more of a stream right <laughs> sort of it's not like oh you kind of get to the next level where there's more prestige and more money and more power and what why instead can't we just be like well everyone can sort of share it out a bit more and it's it's not so kind of getting to the top like of, of the ladder and hierarchy right and and then there's also the problem of like uh, which i think is is the pe thing that like people identify with a lot a lot and sort of talk about a lot which is like when you fall out of the funnel there's sort of this great sense of like disillusionment and sort of not much to show mm -hmm. for it and and it's it's quite i think upsetting to to loads of people because you know this is often people who have like achieved a lot in so they, they were sort of academically probably quite successful in their undergraduate degrees which is why they decided to do a phd they spent a lot of time like probably working quite hard um doing something that can be quite sort of isolating um a lot of phd research is is sort of quite lonely and independent and sort of not not sort of intrinsically a very social affair you have to like make deliberate effort to sort of make it so um and then often sort of past that you know they've gone into sort of a uh, postdoc and and um, something like that, and then sort of maybe in you know their mid thirties or whatever, they're like, oh, this is and and having like tried to apply to like hundreds of academic jobs, they're like, well, none of this is working out. I'm not going to get an academic job. So like, what what am I going to do? And they sort of turn around and and see that actually all all this kind of like in, incredibly specialized um research and sort of research within an institution the university which is always kind of held up as this great kind of you know beacon of like prestige and and education is so important and we really value it as a society and like this is where the brightest and the best go to in fact it's kind of like not valued in like the rest of the labor market um, and sort of depending on your PhD, like if you get a machine learning PhD, there are all kinds of like Google jobs you can go to, right? But like for a lot of PhD um, uh, people and, and people who've sort of left academia further on along the line, like they just find like, well, mm. now I have to, like, it, it feels like all those years were sort of like a waste as if like society is telling them like, you know, none of that 
was worthwhile and sort of no one is going to look at that sort of on the job market and be like, you know, that's an incredible uh, experience and like really worthwhile. Um, and and I think, you know, to many people, it seems like, well, the thing to do would have been to sort of, you know, <laughs> finish off to undergrad and go into the career grind straight away. And, and somehow they're being punished for like, you know, trying to go down this route of, of, doing intellectual inquiry or sort of doing basic research or 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 trying to choose like this this like non-corporate path um which i think is you know rather sad it's obviously not the worst problem that anybody can face in the world but it's it's quite i think it is quite sad heading back to the states now this is austin am i right in thinking a, a stipend is is a wage is that just a particular is that the money you use to survive for the year whilst you're doing your work, or is it just a a, a contribution? How do, how do, exactly does it work? Yeah, yeah. So a stipend is basically just the, the the money that we're earning in exchange for the labor we're doing for the university, and um, and so that will come like the, the the two sort of major forms of labor, uh, or rather the two major positions graduate students tend to have are either the RA, which is research assistant. Uh, or the TA, which is the teacher's assistant. And, and sometimes graduate students are also just full instructors, you know, running our entire our entire courses as if we are full professors, yet we're not given that title. I am a, I'm a geographer right now. I, I did my master's in ecology and, and I switched over to, to geography, human geography, which is a social science. And, and as a social scientist, I'm earning a little bit less than, than people in the STEM fields. And, and we also don't get payments. We don't get stipend payments over the summer when there is no semester in session. Uh, and so we typically need to like, uh, we're on our own over the summer to, to find our own supplemental income uh, in whatever way we can over the summer. Like you say, the obvious places where um, there's uh, exploitation is in what you said, like either teacher's assistant, research assistant, that you then end up doing you can end up in a situation where you are doing the workload of a uh, professor um, without the <laughs> the benefits of being a professor, right? And that must be the, yeah, exactly. the, the most common the most common thing I imagine in that academic world where how exploitation manifests. Exactly right, and and uh, in the U.S. Uh, and specifically at Temple, we are. Um, we're, we're expected to work in exchange for the stipend that we get every semester. We're expected to work um, on the TA or RA position for um, 20 hours per week. And then of course, beyond that is, is, is the, uh, beyond that is, is our own research and, and advancing our own degrees to get the PhD for ourselves and so forth and the coursework and all that. Um, but th- those 20 hours uh, often turn into a lot more than just the, the, the designated 20 hours especially in the case when as PhD students at Temple, we are assigned to be a full instructor. Um, and, and so that in that case, as a full instructor, we are putting in the work to, to write our, our own syllabi, to design our own course. Um, to, and, and, and in this day and age with COVID, now that a lot of the teaching is happening online, we're, we're responsible for designing the like, you know, the Canvas page online, the page where the students are going to be interacting online with all of the material. So all of that stuff is up to us to create. Uh, and then, of course, all of the teaching and, and all of the grading. For some reason, one of those full instructor positions for a PhD student only counts for uh, 10 hours per week, um, even though in reality it takes way, way more than that. And so to reach that 20-hour threshold that, we, that we're required to, to reach to, in order to get the full funding, um, we, we need to also be assigned another position on top of that. Um, so it's just, I, you know, it's just an example of a very uh, sort of um, arbitrarily constructed system of requirements that, that winds up uh, forcing graduate students to, to perform um, vast you know, hours of, 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 of unpaid labor, essentially. And, and you know, in the books, it's, it, it looks a certain way and that's what we're getting paid for. But, but in reality, on the, you know, when, when, the, when the rubber hits the road, when the, when the pen hits the paper, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're staying up all night to do this stuff. We're, we're um, sacrificing our evenings and weekends to do this stuff. If there's these universities with, you know, huge amounts of money pouring into them, where exactly is that money going? 
Like, is it is it hierarchical? Is it? I assume these are run for profits shareholders. Like, who who gets the majority of the cash? Yeah, well, um, I mean, the running joke kind of is that uh, you know, a university like Harvard is. Uh, is a hedge fund with um, with with a few courses attached to it, right? You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> like it, yeah. it's and, and you can say this if you look at maybe an, a, a big wealthy elite um, sort of sports focused university like the University of Michigan. Uh, you can say, yeah, it's a it's a hedge fund. It's also a huge, just enormous sports program with with some maybe some courses attached. There are just enormous volumes of capital flowing through these institutions of of higher education. But, uh, you know, a lot of that doesn't wind up in, in the pockets of, of uh, you know, people actually doing the instructing and doing this sort of real on the ground um, like scholarly work that, that universities are supposed to be about. And the reason in part is we've got we, we're seeing increasingly sort of ballooning administrative positions, uh, you know, administrative departments are, are popping up and, and, um, and buildings themselves at, at um, higher ed institutions are, are um, you know, they're, they're a greater source of, of capital investment at universities, uh, in part because they're trying to attract more undergraduates. They see, they see that as an investment in order to get more, um, you know, these the shiny new buildings to get, to get undergraduates to come. And with the, with the ballooning of these administrative positions, uh, we see like a real sort of um, parallel to what we see in larger society in terms of inequality. Like, for instance, um, I mean, I was just reading about the, the University of Michigan's president, who, who Mark Schlissel, he was, he was recently fired by the board of trustees there just a few weeks ago. Uh, he was caught having an affair with, with, um, with, uh, with a professional subordinate in his office, I, I believe. And, and um, the, the board of trustees decided, it seemed very petty to me, I mean, because they've got a history of, of hiding cases of sexual assault and not dealing with them in the university. But for, in his case, they just decided to really go in on it they released all of his messages publicly and and ousted him and uh but but in just in in reading about that that case i i found that he had been earning um seven hundred thousand dollars per year with his position uh, and of course there was a lot more there were a lot of more a lot more bonuses and bells and whistles added on to that every year but that was sort of his baseline pay right there um, and and the 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 coach the the football coach at the university of michigan um was was earning uh, I think a lot more than I think above um, above uh, the one million mark per year I believe and that's that's you see that across the board at, at different higher ed institutions and meanwhile you've got adjunct instructors uh, doing the actual work of the university and 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 uh, so, you know they they can't make rent or you know they've got to choose between groceries rent or or you know their student debt payments just got this enormous enormous wealth inequality in these institutions that are supposedly supposed to be sort of enlightened bastions of society. Uh, but, but you've got, you know, a, a, a cartoonishly exaggerated um, level of inequality that you see, that you see everywhere else, um, you know, because of capitalist processes elsewhere in society. Well, there was actually just recently, I saw a, a news item where um, there was a ju judicial decision um, to forgive 100. Uh, there was a 35 year old student debtor, um, I, he had $100,000 of student debt and, and he also had epilepsy. And so I don't know the details of, of, of what led to this decision, but there was a judicial decision to forgive his student debt. And, and immediately the, the Biden administration um, came in and, and appealed that decision. Uh, and, and I see that as them, you know, despite their, uh, their, their campaign promises, I see, I see them what, what really when you examine what they're doing in, in the real world as, as it exists is they're, they're fighting tooth and nail, even for little, just little cases like that to prevent um, uh, any sort of foothold for debt forgiveness to come into the scene, uh, because you're exactly right. It would, uh, it would, it would raise a big question of, 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 of its function. And if we can change that, what else can we change? And, and, um, I don't think uh, I think the Biden administration and, and other other powers that be are really they're afraid to let that they're really afraid to let those questions start kind of sweeping across public discourse. I mean, I myself, when I was that age, I had no idea, really. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what this debt. I didn't know much about it. I, I didn't know that it was so difficult um, for people. I didn't know about the like how bad the interest is and, and the fact that some people are paying this debt. Um, you know, some people say they take out $80,000 and then they, they, they pay off over the course of seven years, maybe they pay off $70,000 of that. But then it, given that in that time frame, the interest has increased so much that they're dealing with 
something twice as big as they originally even took out. Uh, and um, so, so I, I, you know, people that are 18 years old and going into this, they have no idea. They don't know what they're getting into, but they still have a sort of implicit sense that um, that that of the burden that this is placing on 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 the people in their generation when they're entering the system. And I can see that, of course, along with um, increasing sort of climate anxiety, it, it, it's hard for them. And uh, and and so at, at these different levels in the, in this in this in this system. We have we we can see the mental health problems manifesting um, in in different ways um, because of the exploitation. I, I come from like a, an agrarian background. I grew up in in a in a rural area, mostly working class, and and so many of my high school peers didn't even go to college, and and and, and so I you know I hear from a lot of them, and I um, I'm getting the increasing sense amongst um, amongst high school people from rural and working class backgrounds that they, um, they're not even bothering anymore. They're like maybe at a, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, they would have at least maybe entertained going to college after high school, but that's, that's becoming less the case. And so we, we're seeing enrollments decreasing across the board, which given the fact that these systems have been created and uh, to, to, to depend so much on that revenue um, of that enormous tuition brought in by students, that decreasing enrollment is, is putting some stress on these, on these systems. And, and so in, in that sense, things are, yeah, like it's, it's, it, you, you, I think that's sort of a rough proxy barometer for this growing sentiment that, yeah, this isn't even worth it. Right? Like it's, 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 it's going to just be a lifetime of debt. How, how has it been uh, from a class perspective, I guess, how, how has that transition been from a working class background to the world of academia, which, uh, is its own <laughs> class, I guess. I really felt it when I got to um, the University of Michigan for my for my master's, um, because I I had never really until that point I had never even like in my undergraduate institution I was never really around. Um, uh, there were there were like more there were other like first generation college students around, but but at, but at, at the master's level at Michigan it hit me really hard because um, suddenly I was um, surrounded by. Uh, you know, well, the town of Ann Arbor, Michigan, where that where that university is, it, it's it's got uh, it's 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 full of like, for instance, sororities and fraternities that are extremely expensive to live in, um, and most of these students are coming from wealthy families from New York or California, uh, and they're driving you know BMWs and 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 that sort of thing around town, and um, you know some of my peers even I, I, I it's it, it it was confusing to me seeing the fact that they would just sort of like take spun spontaneous flights like to New York to party for the weekend or whatever, right? And I was like, wait, yeah. wait, hold on. And then I would find out later, oh, okay, yeah, they're, they're like the heir of some like, you know, corporate corporate founder or whatever. Um, and, 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 and so there was that. And also at the, uh, amongst the students that I was, I was, I was a graduate student instructor um, in my master's program too. And the students I was teaching, some of them were, you know, very wealthy, um, coming from, you know, they're, they're, they even talked about this in our class discussions about their parents being um, CEOs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, so it was, um, there were like sort of, there were subtle sort of um, just cultural differences, um, just in the way people carried themselves between that and what I had been used to, which took a lot for me to get used to, but also just a, a real sense of loneliness, given that I felt I, I was, it was dawning on me when I got there that, not many people there understood uh, my situation and what it feels like to to feel financially precarious and and um, so um, that yeah that was a lonely experience. I even saw, at the University of Michigan at that time between when I was there between 2015 and 2018, um, somebody at the undergraduate level actually put out a document and I'm, I can't remember what it was called, but it was it was a, an undergraduate from a working class background. Um, who was responding to this like sort of um, HR student facing sort of like little um, email or, or, or pamphlet that was sent out, just giving students sort of tips on, on um, how to like navigate living in Ann Arbor as, as undergraduates, you know, living away from home. And some of the points included in that were, you know, like uh, maybe consider like um, maybe consider not hiring a maid to save um, some money or, or maybe, you know, like just these <laughs> absurd things that like, like my, my mom is a maid, right? Like, I, like uh, it, it just, 
so anyway, this this undergraduate student from a working class background responded to that and 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 put out this whole pamphlet. Of, it, its title was along the lines of being not rich in Ann Arbor or or being not rich at the University of Michigan. And it was just a whole kind of survival guide for working class students. Um, and it was, you know, it had a sort of satirical tone to it, but it was also very useful and provided the function of helping people in, in that minority uh, to, to feel, you know, less alone, a little bit less alone in that experience. Um, yeah. And and so you know, Michigan is a public university. It, it, it's it's uh, supposed function is is you know it was it was meant historically to be this place for um, for for people uh, you know as a public good, right? For, for it doesn't matter your 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 economic background, your class background, right? This is meant to be a place to um, funded by the federal and state level where you where where anyone can um benefit from this and and in turn sort of give back to society from this but but uh this university has really really strayed far from that um and and is is structured in order to mostly attract people from families with a lot of money so that they can pay these rising tuitions and and uh, you know pay into these amenities that that the university is using to increase its enormous revenue flow the sort of being between classes, right? And again, like I mean, even though um, instructors in higher ed are are often, especially in the non tenured ones, those of us that are grad graduate students or adjunct instructors, um, we're precarious. We're not. We're 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 earning less than than you know many people that don't even have um, university degrees in the, in the working class. Um, but uh, we're still. It's sort of like this professional managerial milieu you know this um so there's a weird sort of um uh nuanced positionality to to that the, the low earning yet like in this in this professional managerial world um and uh so it, it, that, that's in, to see that through the eyes of for instance like my cousins in uh you know back in in rural united states in um you know people my cousins who most of my cousins did not go to college and and uh, they're you know got trade jobs and so forth and uh, a lot of them are like you know on the right and and, and in the United States and uh, the political right and uh, you know so along with that sort of the the political right in the United States has this notion that you know the, like being a professor is this like you means you're in the elite and you're a part of that whole elite milieu like with George Soros or whatever and uh, you know you're you're um. You, you know, maybe like earning a lot of money. And so it's, 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 uh, it, it's really interesting to when I, when I do, you know, at a family reunion or a funeral or whatever, when I, when I talk to these cousins, uh, to see them like kind of realize that, okay, yeah, this guy is a university instructor, but he's, he's not, he's struggling, you know? And, and so, uh, it's, it's a, it's just very far from the, the, that perception out there uh, of, of how the right sees it, which I, I find really interesting. It's frustrating. It's, it's, it's frustrating. It's interesting. And it makes me wonder what sorts of, um, you know, uh, labor alliances could happen if it weren't for that, uh, you know, erroneous cultural view of, 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 you know, the, the, like the inability to see that there is like a lot of exploitation in, in the professional managerial class. It, it really sucks because sometimes they, they, whether it's higher ed or, or um, you know, other corporate sectors, other other sectors, they oh, and this is uh, the NGO sector, the um, the the nonprofit sector is especially egregious at this. They use this um, sort of mission oriented thing to justify the low pay, the you know, below living wage pay. You know, this is like oh yeah, this is your mission, right? This is like you're sacrificing to do that. Like uh, well. I mean, yeah, there is a lot of meaning in some of these. Like, I feel a lot of meaning in my teaching and in my research. Uh, and it's what it's really what keeps me here. But at the same time, uh, it, it feels just really gross <laughs> that 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 um, that that's being sort of, it, it's being instrumentalized uh, towards that exploitation. And, and that's not unique to higher ed. Do you get any sort of sense on the ground that change is possible or do, do people just have they internalized you know, the cultural ideals or have they sort of internalized sort of defeat? Like why bother? Um, well, I mean, I, I do want to say for one, you know, the reason I stick with this and you can hear the disillusionment that I have with this system. Um, but the reason I'm sticking with it is, is just because I, well, for one, I love my research and I love my teaching and there's absolutely no better feeling than working with undergraduates and seeing them, you know, 
amassing the tools to be able to see the world in new ways and uh, and to be able to analyze problems in society in, in, in ways they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do without this class. And, and so to feel that engagement that they're giving in to the class is an amazing feeling. And 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 so it's it's what keeps me there. And, and as well as you know my research, I think um, I just uh, I love I love working with urban ecology and 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 from a you know a human geography perspective that's really fun stuff and and so this stuff is is very valuable for society i think what i'm doing in my teaching is uh, especially when i teach environmental courses um is is uh, providing enormous use value to the upcoming generation uh, and and I, I see that as as just overall really good for society and so the vision that i have for what higher education could be is um is is, a, is one that is where it's a, it's a public good Right. And I think we got we got some rumblings of that vision along with um, the Bernie Sanders campaign when he was talking about, uh, you know, the the, um, the the value of of, the, of education as a potential free public good in which, you know, it doesn't cost people to to attend universities and and um, and, and in which universities get a lot more funding from um, from the federal and state levels. And so, you know, what we have, what we have right now, though, is a higher ed institution in which um, it, it's it, scholarship is is really just a, a, an instrument for capital, and and we can see the, the, the negative side effects of that. Um, but you know, so that, that's my vision, and in pushing towards that vision, uh, what I what I see is is especially this past half year, like in October, we had that famous you know sort of strike tober moment when. Here in the U.S., we had John Deere workers striking. We had Kellogg's workers striking, um, and we also had some major, um, you know, labor advances in the in the higher ed system. The University of Pittsburgh's um, faculty unionized, and and at the time, that was I forget whether it was October or November, but when they did that, that was the largest new union in the United. United States to, to, to form in however many, you know, however long time. The university, we saw Columbia University graduate students striking. They have a union and, and they, they were striking for um, a while. It was weeks and months, I believe. And, um, and they were able to achieve their proposals, at least, at least the majority of their proposals with their, with their strike. Recently, Princeton University actually just, it, their, their graduate students are not unionized, but, but Princeton gave their graduate student workers uh, an enormous raise, and and, I, and many of them, I believe, at this point, are earning somewhere in the, to the tune of uh, forty thousand dollars a year, um, which is about double what many of like a, what a temple or, or other institutions what many of us are making, and um, and and some some are speculating that the reason Princeton did that is to sort of get out in front of 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 the threat of unionizing efforts. Right? They they can if they can placate their graduate students with that enormous raise. Um, they're going to be less incentivized to put the hard work in to, to unionize and to get that themselves and fight for that themselves. And, and we also see, um, I, I also saw some rumblings of um, potential union organizing at MIT right now. And in the wake of that, the MIT administration is actually putting out anti-union um, campaigns and, and propaganda talking points and, and, and actually asking their their faculty, their professors, to disseminate those talking points to the graduate students, and uh, despite the fact that many of the faculty don't agree with those talking points, uh, so I, I, what I see is a case in which some of these institutions are scared, um, in the same way that the Biden administration doesn't want to see any ground on on, for, on debt forgiveness, even for tiny little cases like that one 35 year old guy with, with epilepsy. Uh, these these administrations, these university administrations, don't want to cede any ground. Um, to you know, they'll they'll put enormous, they'll dump enormous amounts of money um, into um, into making sure that that these union efforts don't start growing. Because even though uh, you know, for instance, a, a, a single bargaining session might only get like, uh, or even a big strike might might only get these graduate students, a, you know, just a little bit of a raise. Um, but but that doesn't that's just not that's not a once and done thing when you've got a union, right? That's an ongoing. Um, challenge to the the unilateral power that these university administrators have, right? It's a um, uh, it, it, it's equalizing that power relationship between the ownership class and uh, and and the laborers in that institution, and so uh, I, they really um, I think they sense that, and for them it's not so much about the amount of the stipend as it is um, that that power relationship, and they really need to protect that at all costs from their perspective. 
Uh, and, and so we also see that sort of manifesting in cases in which, um, you know, like um, at institutions like Temple or the University of Michigan, where we do have graduate student unions, administrations tend to pour out lots and lots of money every year, you know, somewhere near, um, you know, uh, it, it could exceed a million dollars per year on union busting law firms um, in order to, um, uh, you know, bring in uh, some some legal expertise and very, very expensive legal expertise, right? So they're dumping that money that they're dumping into these union busting law firms really could um, go towards uh, improving the, the the conditions for graduate students, right? And, um, you know, people who are, or, or adjunct professors even, who are, who are just struggling to make rent and, and trying to teach the students. But no, they, I mean, it needs to really, it, they're, they're, they're prioritizing, diverting that money into, into uh, maintaining that status quo power relationship. And finally, I spoke to Alice from the UK. So I was looking for ways that I could have more control over my time. I, I like working. I like to be productive. I think most people do, and especially if you've been raised in a cult of neoliberal self-optimization, of course, you think that you like to work all the time. But I wanted to choose when it happened and what it was related to. And I thought that doing a PhD might allow me to do that if I could win a scholarship that would give me a guaranteed income, even though it was very small, that I would have that amount of money coming in definitely. And then I could decide when I worked on my PhD, ostensibly what it was about, et cetera, et cetera. I got in touch with um, a member of the sociology department at York, where I'm living, and said, I'm interested in tiny houses because um, I recognize that housing security is like the fulcrum of being able to live a secure and dignified life or not. Um, and was lucky to win a scholarship. I, I made this big uh, application. It's, it's like a 10 page kind of mini essay where you have to show what research already exists, where the gap is, why you should do it, blah, blah, money, please. They said, yes, there is some money. I have had a better experience at York doing a PhD than I did at Durham doing an undergrad. And I think the main reason for that is the, the autonomy. I, I choose what to work on, how to work on it. And I've also been extremely lucky to have that scholarship. So my income is regular and guaranteed and to have excellent supervisors because I know some people are tormented with like appallingly unpleasant, unsupportive, bullying relationships with their supervisors. I have been so lucky in that regard. Um, but I have also kept working other jobs throughout the duration of that because the stipend is not enough to live on. Um, I don't want to stay working in academics. It's too insular, self-referential. It's an enormous institution with all of the might of like an oil tanker or something, but it moves equivalently as slowly. It's massively still an old boys clubs. I think the notion of Russell Group universities is absurd and deeply colonial, massively patriarchal. Even now, a lot of the reading lists and suggested texts and speakers and blah, blah, blah are, are the classic dead, rich, white guy. Um, I don't think that it's really possible to have a university that does meaningful like social action work because that is just at odds with their function as a business. They are profit-driven institutions. They have no imperative to do any of that good, important work, which I'm more interested in than I am in the clout and status of being an academic. One of the things that I have been doing alongside the PhD is that myself and some friends, some people that I know, set up a community benefit society. In summary, we are trying to take over a decommissioned care home in the city and renovate it into radically affordable housing. We're looking at turning it into 17 units of flats. The financial model for the development is that it will always be functional based on the expectation that people will only ever be able to pay um, local housing allowance as rent on the flats. Um, this is a, a completely flat hierarchy of people working together. We use sociocracy as our governance, like structure I suppose you could say it's kind of has um anarchism at its at its roots in terms of looking to to the, the asset will be locked into the community benefit society so that the land and property will never be able to be speculated on or sold privately it will always be owned and run by the fully mutual housing co-op that 
take over once we've finished the development. We're looking to raise the money. We'll need, I guess, about £2 million to complete the whole thing. It's going to be done by community share offers. Some some grant money that we've raised already, we're taking it to the pre-planning stage as it stands. This type of community, like really community organising, we're walking around in the streets going, do you think that housing in New York is a total piss take which ruins people's lives? And everyone says yes. And we say, do you want to come and have a look at this thing that we're doing over here? That is really, really meaningful. It's face to face. It's intimate. It's connecting. We put on events where we give people food and hot drinks you know like there are areas of york which are so deprived unbelievably deprived and we can do real things there make a real difference in the short term and in the longer term by providing this housing those feel like places where you still do a lot of knowledge work you still upskill yourself and the people around you you have a material impact on fellow human persons Everything about that appeals to me so much more than whatever shadows of those things can be accessed through the university. Uh, it's huge, and and housing co-ops and all that sort of stuff is uh, it's sort of very obvious that that that, that makes a, an immediate difference to loads of people's loads of people's lives. So, I mean, you know, I guess in terms of um, the educational establishment, you know, facilitating at least some of that is, that's a sort of glowing uh, positive, right? It's true. You're right, because I know that something that helped to open the door for us with both funders for the initial um, seed funding that we got to start the project off and with getting conversations with the local authority, Homes England, people like that, it did help that I had the legitimization of being a PhD researcher at a Russell Group institution, that that helped to legitimise our claim, you know, mm -hmm. so that it wasn't as easy to dismiss us as like left-wing, radical, commune-starting hippies or whatever. Yeah. I could go on there with a persona that they more easily related to and identified with. Yeah, that's maybe that's what change is, that it is sort of deliberate actors sort of wearing the clothes of respectability to communicate with other institutions and then you sort of use your powers for good you sort of do a sort of robin hood kind of thing yeah um, yeah but then i just keep thinking about you know audrey lord's the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and i wonder again if that's saying like oh i'm so sneaky and chivalrous wearing the cloak of white colonial intellectual power when really that's just an easy thing for me to do and mm. it's comfortable and not risky. I would say on the whole I've had an enormously positive and hugely privileged experience of education throughout my whole life and especially as a PhD candidate. I have got access to the money that the university has access to like scholarships and I have the opportunity to apply for summer school placements and blah blah money to do things which I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So in the genesis of Op House, the, the group that we've we've made to to take over this care home, the university and the Economic and Social Research Council released a fund called the Social Enterprise and Social Sciences like Collaboration Fund blah blah bureaucracy language um, but there was money available to foster links between institutions and local community groups hello it's perfect for me i am the link between the university and the community groups and we got money to pay real people to do actual labor at decent rates in our business so that's a, a hugely beneficial and privileged thing that you have access to at the university there's there's all kinds of great things about it my my problems and like any cons about it come from much more of, of like uh, a theoretical and a, a, just a critical engagement with what's going on around me in the world place rather than anything terrible that's happened to me yeah well there's um, there's clearly something about the system that works because to some degree you have tried uh, you've you know applied yourself clearly throughout your sort of uh, through throughout your life and and you've been rewarded for the effort right like you've you've won sort of you've or at least one of the winners in terms of the academic 
system. Like the, the, everyone who, you know, um, was part of, you know, interviewing you or looking through all the stuff that you did was obviously impressed. And they're like, yeah, cool. You, you know, go on to move on to the next level. <laughs> um, so, so, so I think that, you know, that's all positive. They're all things where you can say, look, you know, the, the system works, I guess, presumably, maybe where that perspective falls apart is like, well, you know, it only works for a few people. And, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And my ability to thrive in academia is always underpinned by other social structures in my life. Like the fact that I'm in a secure long-term relationship, which provides me with an enormous amount of emotional support. There's a lot of labor done in those intimate relationships, which enables my ability to be a good scholar. Mm. I don't live in a war-torn place. I never have to think about if I will have food or water, even whilst I experience financial constraints that are stressful. There, there is a spectrum of how bad those worries are. There is. And sure. mine is on the less bad end of the spectrum, you know? Yeah. All of my friends, the fact that I have a gym membership, like the list is so long of other structural factors of the privileges that I haven't earned but that I have access to which enable me to have a good experience in academia I think that's really important to foreground because it's just too easy to slip back into the trap of being like I am a clever hard worker and that's why I'm having such a good time and that's just like such a tiny component of it it is a component of it I am a try hard (laughs) that's a small part do you know what I'm saying and what what do we mean when we say that the university is working right because we can also say that the police force is working per what they are actually setting out to do, it's working. Capitalism is also working for what it's set out to do. So when we say that the university is working, what what do we mean? What is it doing, actually? Is yeah, it's it a creating a class. It's, it's creating uh, smart people to rule over the dumb people. <laughs> Isn't it? It's encouraging us to identify with this like professional class so that we sort of think that we're capitalist even when we're not really because we don't own any of the like means of production or whatever, but it enforces this kind of false division between oh the, the, the stupids down there and I don't know, I, I have to work on the assumption that as an intertangled component of the state apparatus, that its core function is not very good. <laughs> well, a colleague of mine who I'm writing a paper with at the moment, she's based in another university and she's a bit older than me. She's a senior lecturer now. Um, and she has openly said the entry requirements into the most junior academic positions now are astronomically higher than they were when I entered academia. And they were high then, it was difficult then. Um, but she conceded that when she first got uh, like her first academic post, there was no expectation that she should have published papers or have organised conferences or really have any discernible skills except from that which is demonstrated by completing a PhD. Um, but now I know that recently the OECD released a report, I think it was last year, um, showing that between 2014 and 2019, there was a 25% increase in the number of PhDs, people undertaking PhD research, whilst at the same time, almost an equivalent reduction in the amount of academic posts available. So there are loads more people now with PhDs. It's still not super common, but but comparatively. And the amount of academic positions that are available is just decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. What there is getting loads more of is admin positions, which links back to this like grotesque self-replicating function that universities seem to increasingly fulfill rather than anything to do with what they nominally set out to do, which is educate people. You need a lot of admin to keep the self-replicating machine going. In this OECD report, that one of the key findings was that a highly competitive, super individualized um, environment within academia has meant that especially PhD and early career researchers' mental health is like the worst that it's ever been because of high levels of precarity, m- much more um, fixed term contracts rather than like safe contracts, which means that you'll get taken on for a project, the project will last for a year or 18 months, and then you don't have a job any longer. So you have to spend at least some of those last months of your short project looking for another job and interviewing and doing all that stuff. There'll be periods of time in between where you're not contracted and you just have absolutely no income whatsoever. You can't get a mortgage when you're only employed on um, fixed term contracts. And 
up to 70% of all academic staff now are on fixed term contracts. Tenure is going, becoming less and less and less common. And of course, another boon, as far as institutions are concerned, is that tenure was ostensibly introduced in order to protect freedom of academic speech so that you couldn't say, this university is a pile of shit, and then they could sack you. Um, so it it kind of makes sense that there'll be less and less and less tenured positions as universities become more and more and more neoliberally formulated um, because they have a vested interest in not platforming critical voices of the university. But it kind of made me laugh, the OECD report, like laugh in a depressed way. Um, that they're saying, yeah, the problem with academics is that it's extremely competitive and hyper individualized. And I thought, oh, yes, unlike the rest of the world, which is not like that at all. <laughs> it seemed a bit of, I mean, of course, that was the focus of their research, but it always feels like there's something lacking when we don't acknowledge. And that's because everything about how society is formulated from the ground up prioritizes creating these conditions. So there we go. That was our trip through the world of academia. If you have any questions or thoughts, email us at it's not just in your head at gmail.com. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. For those that want to hear more from Harriet, she has a radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.